Hi everyone, Philip Shields here. Wouldn't we all love to see a lot more healings, especially dramatic, powerful healings upon the end of the prayer for healing, bang, someone's healed. But true dramatic healings, uh, especially instant ones, are not real common among believers, not even the ones I prayed for. So let me be clear about that, though I feel a number of my prayers for healings have been dramatic, have been sudden and instant. I gave a bunch of those in part one. I still do pray for people and, and, and don't see that person healed. And so some of you hearing this have received my prayers for you and you're not healed yet. I gave my own experience of some very dramatic healings in my own body. And yet I still have certain aches and pains and problems in my life not going away. So what is the story behind all that? And today I want to talk about part two on, on, on healings uh, that in the last sermon I shared some really dramatic stories, I hope inspiring stories. Here in part two, I want to talk about what's the biggest, what's the biggest single thing that's causing us not to have healings. What's that biggest single thing? And um, so we'll talk about that. Romans 10, 17, prayer. I mean, faith comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of God. So be sure you watch part one. I think it will inspire you to have more faith that God is, in fact, still answering prayers today. And don't be like some who believe God is not any longer. I'll talk more about that today, too. And I was hoping these stories would inspire you to realize the truth that God does still heal, wants to heal, expects to heal, and wants us expecting him to heal. It's also true that not everyone is getting healed. In fact, a lot of people are being prayed for and not getting healed at all. And uh, so we want to find out what's going on and if there's anything we can do to correct a situation that would allow God and make him want to show us more healings, where we would see more healings, by all means, let's do it. So welcome again, everyone. I'm Philip Shields. I'm host and founder of Light on the Rock Ministries. We started that about 20 years ago. And I'm starting 2024 with these series, I think a three-part series on healing uh, and then the faith that goes into these healings and, and uh, powerful miracles that I, I believe we should be seeing and could be seeing if we would just, in fact, really look to God and understand them and have the faith for it. In this Light on the Rock, we have hundreds and hundreds of videos, audios, sermons and audios, blogs, articles. So please check us out. Learn to use the search bar at the top right. I'll have Scott be showing you that right now as I, as I speak about it. Just type in a word or two is ideal uh, from a topic or, or headline you're looking for, a title you're looking for, maybe three words. But the more words, then you're far better off finding what you're looking for with just one or two words. So you might look up the word healing, for example, and uh, instead of a big, long title. So our website grows by word of mouth. And so if you like what you're hearing and seeing and hear, please, by all means, let other people know about it and, and share, share the news. And uh, we also do gratefully accept and ask you for. <laughs> now, we do accept. Uh, financial support because we are trying to get this out to the whole world and uh, right now we're doing quite a bit of work in Kenya and Tanz Tanzania and soon uh, other countries around and so um, really could use your help because they're so poor so poor we we literally have bought hundreds of Bibles for them uh, they just don't have the money even for Bibles and some few do and that was about it so when you're only making one or two dollars a day if you can find work, that's not even enough to buy food for the for the whole family. Anyway, back to healing. And thank you if you do decide to support us. Um, I would really appreciate that. So I've received more stories of powerful healings. I just got one from a wonderful friend of ours in Arizona, a lady named Linda. And um, she wrote me a detailed uh, story of her own husband and how he was near death several times with a series of episodes involving his heart and cardiomyopathy and atrial fibrillation, uh, different things, that, and then surgeries that were very, very precise. They needed to be precise and 
within the artery and the heart and so forth, and one little nick could change the whole thing, um, and how doctors were not very positive that it would end positive, but she believed and she called friends and they all prayed with all their being and doctors were amazed that her husband was leaving there healed. Praise God. It's a case of healing, definitely, and protection in the, in the face of uh, not a lot of hope being given even by the doctors treating the man. Then I got a letter from Ondigo, one of our precious uh, pa pastors in Kehancha, um, almost said Florida, Kehancha, Kenya. That's in southwestern Kenya. And uh, he wrote me a letter. I'll just read it. Dear Philip, he says, there are so many examples. Oh, one can't, uh, but one I can't forget about is Peter Ogendo. Peter Ogendo from Migori. That's a different town nearby. Peter's a shoe shiner. That's his job. Peter Ogan Ogendo is who we're talking about. Then a friend of his named Grantone from Migori told me that Peter needed our prayers. He just had a bad stroke, paralyzing the whole right side of his body. And it was almost like his right side had died. Anyway, he was admitted to hospital. His wife had lost hope, was waiting for her husband's departure. Grantone and I prayed, and about 24 hours later, Peter was healed. I mean completely healed of his stroke. Therefore, clearly, God heals. He doesn't need us having a lot of knowledge of the scriptures in order to heal us. Or Anyway, he needs faith, which most people like me sometimes lack, he says. God's will be done. So best regards, your brother on Digo. And today I'm going to cover various aspects of what I believe is the single biggest reason why we're not seeing more healings than we are, and how that problem uh, can get into our head and infect our whole thinking. We might not even realize that we have this problem that I'm talking about. What am I talking about? I'm talking about unbelief having either no faith or very little faith, and that will definitely affect miracles and wonderful things. Uh, several times Jesus said, why, why didn't you believe? Why did you fear? Oh, you faithless generation. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you not believe? Jesus asked that question several times. So here are signs that you or I may be sliding into unbelief. Signs that we may be sliding into unbelief include the feelings of losing peace of mind. You might be feeling like you're losing your mind because of the trial you're facing, the pain you have, the diagnoses, uh, the child, the husband, the wife not being healed, feeling so stressed. Okay? If you remain there, that can lead to unbelief if it isn't right off the out, from the outset. Feeling fear, being afraid of the news of your health. I know when I was told you have stage four pan pancreatic and liver cancer, uh, I had to fight fear from coming in there. In fact, my initial feeling was, oh no, my son's going to have to grow up without a father, without a dad, like I did. He was maybe 11 or 12 at the time. Losing faith, having little or no faith, just giving up. These are all signs of unbelief. Waiting for someone to die, that's unbelief. Worrying, doubting if this will work, if this will work out okay. Lacking complete trust in God, turning into a nervous wreck. <laughs> this describes someone in unbelief, and more probably. Unbelief, I believe, is the single biggest reason for not seeing more healings. I'm going to show you uh, ways that we hold on to this unbelief and how it demonstrates in, 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 in our beliefs and you'll, you'll see that as we go through. And I'm giving this sermon, by the way, as much for me as for anyone else. I would love to have more people I pray for be healed. I've had some dramatic ones. I gave those in, in part one, at least some of them. And I keep thinking of more and more. There are others. I remember a lady and her husband in uh, New Brunswick, in, in northeastern New Brunswick, Canada. And we went to go visit them. Uh, when, when I was over there, and uh, she had been barren. She could not have a child. And the doctors told her she couldn't have a child. So I anointed her, and it wasn't long after that, in fact, the husband called me and said, hey, great news, she's expecting. And it was such an unusual event, so unexpected by the community, that next time I went up, 
about 18 or 20 people all showed up. They wanted to meet and talk about it, get anointed for their own conditions as well. But anyway, for uh, this is as much for me as anyone else because I, I need to have more healings as well, people I pray for. And by faith, now I told you what I meant by unbelief, okay? Feeling like a nervous wreck, losing your peace of mind, worrying, worrying, worrying. That's a real sign of unbelief when you worry, when you doubt. Faith, on the other hand, absolutely believes that God still heals today as he did in the time of Jesus on earth and the apostles. Faith, good faith, expects God and expects that God wants the best for us and normally wants to heal us. Someone in faith believes that healing is usually God's will. Usually. There are exceptions. I am not one of these who says God always heals or always will heal. There are too many examples of otherwise, which I'll give later on. Uh, someone in faith feels at peace no matter what's happening. If you've really accepted that God's in charge of your life and, 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 and you want his will to be done, uh, no matter how bad it's going, at some point you have peace. and You've accepted it. When our son died, I remember praying by the bedside and saying, Father, now I have to practice what I preach and thank you in all things and for all things. I thank you that you gave us a son, even though it wasn't very long. I thank you that we had him the time we had him. And so someone in faith will actually thank God in and for the trial and the problem. We're looking to God. We trust, we trust, we trust him. Even when we have no idea where he's heading, where he's taking us. It's keeping our eyes and thoughts fixed on God no matter what. Isaiah 26 verse 3 and 4. Perfect peace has he whose mind has stayed on you. A child of faith, a child of God, will praise and thank God for all things, like Ephesians 5.20 says, and in all things, like Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. I've given whole sermons on that. Yes, for and in all things. It's feeling calm, even though we don't understand what God's doing. And it's feeling that whatever God decides is going to be okay by me too, because he's in charge of my life. That's real faith. A lot of times that takes a lot of effort to get to that point. Do I really trust God that all things are working out for the good for those who are the called? Okay, as Romans 8.28 says. We'll discuss positive faith much, much more in the next sermon. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Okay, faith is the substance of things we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So we must believe even before we see the physical, the material, the natural evidence of a healing or a miracle that having taken place. We must believe. We must believe. We have faith even when we're wondering what God's doing. But it's hard to keep unbelief and doubt at bay when the prospects that we're looking at, if we're looking at the prospects, look scary. We are often pointed to Abraham as the father of the faithful. And we're often told to read, I'll post it up there as, I, as I'm talking about it, Romans 4, verses 18 to 22, that when God told him, you're going to have a son. Now, the first time God told him that, he was about 75 years old. When God first called him out, his wife had been barren, and uh, he didn't have a son. So, uh, 75 years old, but it was closer to when he finally was 100 years old that God told him again that you and your wife, who's 90 now, are going to have a son, even though all the evidence was to the contrary, that Sarah was dead in her womb. And Abraham was dead in his ability to make a baby at this point. But verse 20, Romans 4, verse 20, it does say in 19 that he didn't waver, he wasn't weak, didn't consider his own body already dead. Okay, so that's how bad his ability to beget a child was. I'm trying to be nice how I say it. 
Verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what God had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6 says he believed God, so it was counted to him for righteousness. So we're told Abraham's our example, but I just want to encourage you a little bit that Abraham didn't get there in one fell swoop. God called him initially at 75, but um, called him, this way, at least when he went to Canaan, it was, uh, he was 75 years old, uh, Genesis 12. And uh, we're told he didn't waver, but what was that about lying, telling Sarai to please tell everyone you're my sister, you really are my sister, half-sister, but let's not tell them you're also my wife because they'll kill me because you're so beautiful at 65 at the time that they'll kill me for you. So he lied. That wasn't faith. The whole story of Hagar, when Sarah brought Hagar to Abraham, said, how about maybe God blesses those who try to work out themselves as much as they can. So take Hagar and whatever baby comes out of Hagar and you will be our child that God's promised us. Well, that wasn't God's idea. That was man's idea. It was a lack of faith. And so when we read of Abraham, don't feel somehow, I feel, <clears throat> I just fall so far short of Abraham. You don't, don't be thinking that. Because uh, Abraham himself had to grow in that ability to have such great faith. Let me remind you, though, that we are supposed to be seeing healings in our believer churches. Those are promises from Yeshua and Jesus. Uh, he said very, very clearly in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, these signs will follow those who believe, not those who have unbelief. Who believe? Cast out demons. Speak with new tongues. They won't be hurt by deadly snakes. And the end of it, they will lay hands on the sick and they will be made well. They will recover. In James 5, 14 and 15, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. My point in reading these is just to remind us, we do have promises that prayers of faith will heal the sick. And when you pray for, the, for healing, quote these, remind God of his promises. Claim those promises. Okay, now notice we read, it's a prayer of faith that those signs will really follow. How deadly it is to answer prayers when we don't have faith. Can you imagine a time when God himself, God in the flesh, Jesus, was unable to do miracles, was unable to heal, except for a few, so he was able to do some, but not as much as he wanted because of unbelief. Let's read it for ourselves. And this has to be a lesson for all of us. I read part of it even last sermon, Mark 6, verses 1 to 6. He goes back to Nazareth. Okay, he preaches in the synagogue. Everyone's amazed. Isn't this the kid we knew growing up down the block? Isn't this uh, the, the carpenter? And aren't his brothers and sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. In verse 5, now he could do no mighty work there. The Son of God himself could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So he did heal some. But those few he did heal probably were not ones who had unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. Okay, it says in, uh, in Matthew 13, 58, uh, it, it says clearly because of their unbelief, because of their unbelief that he couldn't heal them, Matthew 13, 58. So God especially heals those who believe in him and in his son, Jesus Christ. 
There's a well-known statement, we all know that all things are possible with God, or with God all things are possible. The more complete statement is what Jesus, Yeshua himself said to the man whose son was demon-possessed and being cast into the rocks and fire and water and so on. And he was really struggling with faith, seeing what was happening with his son. And Jesus said to him in Mark 9.23, <clears throat> in Mark 9.23, if, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. And you know his famous response, yes, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later in the sermon. Jesus did end up healing that boy, casting out the demon, even though there was some mix of belief and unbelief in the man. So I'm not saying that Jesus can't or won't heal someone if there's unbelief. If he wants to, he will. But normally we have to have that faith. That's the law that God's put out there. I think that miracles happen when there's faith. Does it require a huge amount of faith? I saw a picture of a, a mustard seed, and Jesus says in Luke 17, verse 5 and 6, when the apostles came to the Lord and said, increase our faith, he said, you know what? If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, it's barely a little, little dot that fits between my fingers there. I hope we can put a picture up like that. If you had faith even that small, it doesn't take much, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be cast into the sea and it would obey you. So I hope we're all going to be striving to grow in faith and ask God for more faith, just like the apostles asked Jesus. Now, trying to heal when there's unbelief going on is something Jesus didn't want to even chance having to go through. So in the chapter before finding unbelief in Nazareth, we read in Mark 5, starting in verse 21, all the way to 43, Mark 5, 21 to 43, that a man named Jairus had a very sick girl, very sick daughter, 12 years old, near to death. And Jairus comes up to Jesus and says, please, please come to my house. My daughter's really sick. Come and pray for her. Okay. And uh, that's Mark 5, 22, 23 and uh, lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So he had faith. He believed in Jesus and he had faith. Jesus showed what Jesus and God, what they want to do is heal. So Jesus went along with him, followed him, and throngs followed him. Now, he obviously wanted to heal on the way up. It's a well-known story of a woman with a flow of blood for 12 years. Had spent everything she had on the doctors. I'm now in verse 25, 26, 27. She heard Jesus was coming around. She says, oh, if I can just go and touch the hem of his garment. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. So she had tremendous faith. If she was bleeding, she was not supposed to be in the public arena. She knew that, but she really wanted to get healed. She was supposed to stay away from people. Verse 29, though she does touch his clothes. Verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood. Okay, she came in from behind him in verse 27 and touched his garment because she had said, if I just would touch his clothes, I know I'll be made well. Verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Just like the story of Michelle that I was telling you in part one, Michelle was not even a churchgoer at the time. She was not living righteously. She admits that herself. And yet one of the most spectacular healings that I've been involved in was with Michelle and her preemie baby, premature baby, five months along in the, in the womb one pound, four ounces. 
and then Michelle herself needed healing. And go back and listen to the story in part one and the energy and the power that she felt. And so Jesus immediately, verse 30, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples says, everyone's touching you. What do you mean who touched me? And he looked around and he, he knew that something special had happened. And he saw the woman there fearing and trembling because she had broken the law. Knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She was scared. She could have gotten in trouble for that. But he said to her daughter, your faith, it wasn't even Jesus' faith. Jesus didn't even know that was going to happen. He doesn't seem to have known it was going to happen. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your affliction. Your faith. While he was still speaking, now here's where it gets even doubly interesting. Someone came from the house of the ruler of the synagogue and he said, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher any further. No need for that. Now look what Jesus did. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken that the daughter had died, he said to Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. You've just been told your daughter's dead. What's Jesus saying? You get news like that. Don't think about it. Just believe. You've been told you need your leg amputated. Or you've been told that you have stage four cancer of the pancreas and liver. Don't look at the reports. Don't think about it. Just believe. So he's telling Jairus, don't give it any thought. Don't dwell on the things that will cause unbelief. Don't do it. So having faith at a time like that, you've just been told your 12-year-old has died, will depend on what you focus on. Jesus was saying, don't focus on what the guy just told you. Don't do it. Don't listen to them. Just believe. Don't even think about her having just died. Just believe. Don't believe it's too late. Just believe that something different can happen. Jesus wanted to stop all the thoughts in their tracks of unbelief. Verse 37, he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, except Peter, James, and John. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult, tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, why are you making such a commotion? child's not dead. child's just sleeping. The Bible does call death a type of sleep. They ridiculed him, but when he put them all outside, he didn't want any unbelief. He put them all out. He took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him, and he entered where the child was lying. Now, I believe that when I now, he had Peter, James, and John, and probably the parents there with him and nobody else. Uh, I, when I need prayers, yes, I'll call for a group, a small group, to pray for me. But I don't just put it all out there for the whole world to know that I want prayers. I don't know how many people that I'm asking for prayers have any faith. And I don't want their unbelief to affect my belief and affect my healing that could happen. I hope you follow what I'm saying. So I do believe in group prayers. The whole church got together in Acts 12 to pray for Peter. But even notice, even in that story, so many didn't believe, even when Peter was outside knocking on the door. So you must talk to people who have strong faith to pray for you. I don't want any unbelief getting in there, that's for sure. It's so easy to let doubt come in. So anyway, um, then he took the child, verse 41, this is Mark 5, 41, and said to her, Talitha kume, kume, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up, arise. Now, 
If you're someone praying for someone else, if you're a minister or whatever, and the person's dead, how many of you would have the faith to say, get up? Or if a person can't move because they're totally paralyzed, how many of us would have the faith to say, stand up and walk? What if he doesn't stand up and walk? I look like a stupid idiot. What if the dead girl doesn't get up? But what if she does get up? Because in your faith you told her to and God heard that and answered that. We have to step out in faith more. I do. I definitely do. When our son died, I think I was like, what, 29 years old or something. When little David died as a baby, I did try resurrecting him. I haven't told very, very many people that, but now I have. And <laughs> just now, I'm not ashamed to tell you that. His body was rock hard, as hard as a table. Rock hard. I thought I believed, and so I announced, David, wake up, get up. In Jesus' name, get up. But he did not. That time my faith wasn't answered, or maybe it wasn't strong enough. I don't know. But surely we should try anyway. Verse 42, immediately the girl, the 12-year-old girl, arose and walked, for she was 12 years old. They were overcome with great amazement. Are you seeing the power of unbelief, how Jesus, in Mark 6 that we read earlier, could do no mighty work there except a few that he healed because of their unbelief. And then in this story, how he put out anybody outside. I'm going to pray for this child. I don't want any of you here. So now contrast unbelief with the fact that so many times when a healing took place, Jesus himself credited the healing to the person's faith, strong belief. I'll rattle off a few here. We just read one by the woman with the issue of blood. Your faith has saved you, has made you well. Your faith. Mark 5, 34. The paralytic man lower, lowered down through the roof by four other men. He commended their faith in Mark 2. Blind men in Luke 18, 42. Luke 18, 42. Your faith has made you well. The ten lepers, one returned to say thank you. In Luke 17, verses 17 to 19, he says to the one who returned, Your faith has made you well. We'll talk more about faith, part three. I'm talking about unbelief in this one. So we've got to eliminate the unbelief. And we want to see more prayers answered and more healings done. Don't get me wrong, there were times. And there are cases when Jesus and the apostles healed, even when belief wasn't evident or being expressed. I think of the woman who was bent over for 18 years, I think it was, couldn't straighten herself up. Yeshua, Jesus, saw her in the synagogue and called her to him. She didn't come to him on her own. She called her to him and touched her and healed her bent over condition without her apparently even asking. Peter and John in Acts 3 healed the lame man who was asking for money, was begging, he was a beggar. He wasn't asking for healing, but gold and silver have we none, but what we have will give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up! Where's our faith to do that? You who pray for others, have you ever done that kind of faith? I speak to myself as well. Yeah, I'm giving this as much to myself as to anybody. Jairus' daughter was dead. Perhaps it was the faith of her parents that counted. Anyway, God does whatever he pleases to do in heaven or on earth. Understand that. He's not going to let our lack of faith stop him if he wants to heal Although it seems to be that his law is that you have to have faith, uh, but he can do as he pleases. Psalm 135, verse 6, 
The Lord will do as he pleases in heaven and on earth. I just say that because sometimes people go overboard and insist that not even God can heal if there's unbelief. I'm saying normally that might be true. I'm not about to say God can't do anything. Okay? Okay, so when God wants to, of course he can still heal. But from Scripture, we see that he wants to see faith as much as possible. Now, beliefs that will lead us into unbelief. Number one, these are beliefs that will lead you into unbelief. You ought to write this down and pray about them. Believing the lie that God has decided mostly, apparently, you believe, to not heal nowadays, at least not as much as he used to. It's clear he's not healing as much today as before, but to believe that he's decided that, to believe he doesn't want to, that's a different level. Do understand that when people came to Jesus to be healed, they believed. That's why they came to him. They believed. That's why she wanted to touch his garment. They believed. That's why they called out to him, blind, blind man and so on. When they came to the apostles in Acts chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and other places, they believed and they were healed. We must believe that God still heals. A variation of number one is falsely believing that by his stripes we were healed, were healed, 1 Peter 2.24, is referring just to spiritual healing. I heard that in church, and I just about threw up. It's apparent God does not heal today like he used to in the days of the apostles. And number two, when we read the verse that by his stripes you were healed, that's not talking about physical healing. That's talking about spiritual healing, about being saved. It includes that. But there were just too many healings going on, including by Peter, including Peter's own shadow, that for me to believe that Peter did not believe that by his stripes we were healed physically and spiritually. I'll take that too. But that's abominable. Don't believe that. That's a lie and will lead you to unbelief. God still heals, number one. Don't believe he has decided not to. Number two, by stripes we were healed is physical healing as well as spiritual. Number three, another variation. Believing God will heal only when it's his will to heal. And deep inside, if we're in unbelief, we can start believing it must not be his will because I'm not healed yet. It must not be his will. Or a variation is that his will is mostly, this is a lie, is mostly not to heal nowadays. Don't let thoughts like that come into your head. His will is mostly not to heal nowadays. Okay, I can see why we think that because that's what we see going on. He's not healing. I'm not about to blame God, though. I'll blame you. And I'll blame me. But not God. Praise God. He does still heal. I gave you some examples last time. We know we have to pray, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even Jesus in Gethsemane. Is there any other way, O oh God, O oh Father? Abba, is there any other way? But not my will. I don't want my will. I want your will to be done. So yes, we want to pray our healing is God's will, but don't weaken that into assuming that if you're not healed, this might mean that God's will is not to heal you. Maybe God's going to, maybe God's will is to take some time, maybe there's some healing going on already, like when he cursed the fig tree, it was killed from the roots of that very moment. But they didn't notice it done until the next day. So do we have to convince God to heal us? Please don't go there. That's poppycock. Don't go there. Start knowing it is God's will to heal you most of the time. There are some times 
that God decided not to heal. Or God, and we're all going to die eventually. Okay? You and I are not going to be healed and healed and healed and healed forever and ever and never die. The prophet Elisha died from an illness. Isaac was blind, so blind he couldn't tell was this Esau or was this Jacob coming in. He could tell by voice to some extent. Timothy had frequent infirmities and so was told to drink a little wine for your frequent infirmities. Paul didn't heal Timothy. Paul didn't heal, uh, what's his name, Trophimus, whom I left in Malta sick. Why did he leave him in Malta sick? We read later on that he was in fact healed, but uh, not right away, not quickly by Paul. So I'm, I'm wondering about that. And then Paul himself had some kind of thorn in the flesh that wasn't healed, and uh, or whatever it was, it wasn't taken away. But Paul had lessons to learn. And so, so many times, so many times, we are being perfected in the pain we go through, in the suffering we go through. Even Jesus was perfected by the things which he suffered. I don't have that in my notes. I don't know where that verse is. I think it might be Hebrews 2, verse 10, that he was perfected by the things which he suffered. We also are being perfected by the things which we suffer. It says so in Peter and James and other places, Hebrews and so on. So it's not always a bad thing to have something that you've got to struggle with because that makes you go to God. If every single time we were healed instantly, miraculously, powerfully, we would get to the point where we just look to that person to pray for us. We wouldn't even keep looking to God. So there are lots of examples. God wants us well. He wants us well. Okay? If, if at all possible, he wants us well. John 10.10, 10, he says, He came, I've come that you might have life and have abundant life. Have it more abundantly. He says, I'm not like that thief who comes to steal kill and destroy. No, I'm your good shepherd, and I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Third John 2, beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health. Okay, now there's still many times that we're going to struggle with our health, and in those times we seek God and pray to him, especially if someone is dying or in a lot of pain, someone we love, and those are good things for us to go through until God decides to heal and God does want to heal most of the time. He doesn't always do it right away. So God's will to heal can be stopped, though, if we fight his will. If we fight his will. I want you to know that. A lot of people think God's will is always done. That's not true either. God gives us free moral agency. So when Jesus was coming back to Jerusalem for the crucifixion, in Matthew 23, Verse 37, he weeps over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. Matthew 23, 37. <clears throat> How often I wanted, I wanted, this was my will, to gather you and your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Here God saying, my will was to not let all this happen in Jerusalem. But you weren't willing to do your part. Another time, God's will for the Pharisees was to be baptized by John the Baptist. But they were not willing. Luke 7, verses 29 and 30. And when all the people heard him, John the Baptist, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John, Luke 7.30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God. Can you reject the will of God? Yeah, I just read it. They rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by John, by him. Now, God eventually started goading someone named Saul, Shaul, 
and then finally had to appear with to him in a bright light. Saul, Saul, Shaul, Shaul, why are you kicking against my goads to make you wake up? I'm trying to call you. But yeah, we can resist God's will. So pray that you not do that. <laughs> pray that you not have any unbelief. Pray that you don't resist his will. Now, so there are very few cases where it truly is not God's will to heal. And I just gave you some, Elisha and so on, like I mentioned. And uh, Isaac, with his blindness, David got to where he couldn't stay warm. He got no heat. And uh, I told you about an angel and that had to be an angel who came and said she was sent to tell my brother and me that God still loved him and heard his prayers and knew all about him because he was beginning to wonder about that. And I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would make that clear. But uh, she said, and it was a female, it's known by God, God knows you, God hears all your prayers, but for reasons he didn't divulge to me, Lauren, he used her name, she used his name, I mean, she used his name. Lauren, you're not going to be healed of your strokes. So for some times, God, God will choose not to heal someone that happened to my own brother. And so many times, when Jesus was asked to heal, if he was willing, he was always, in his lifetime that I could see, was willing. I'll give examples in my notes. Matthew 8, this is right after the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 8, he came down off the mountain. He's done with the Sermon on the Mount now. Great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him. He wasn't supposed to be there. The leper, I mean. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus does something. He put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleaned. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I am willing. I'd like you to pray that prayer to Jesus Christ. I'd like you to pray that prayer to Father in heaven. Father, if you're willing, would you have Jesus touch me and heal me? And I know you're willing because of the examples. Luke 5, verse 12 and 14, similar story, similar results. So quit wondering if he's willing to heal you. Two blind men in Jericho were making such a ruckus, the whole crowd started telling them to shut up. Jesus found out about it and said, no, no, bring them here. And, uh, okay, they brought him to Jesus. Your lucky day, they told him. He wants to talk to you. And he healed them. Yes, he was concerned. He had compassion. He healed them. Two blind men in Jericho. You can pray the same prayers, the same words that those blind men had. If you're willing, we know you can make us see again. We believe in you. We want to have our eyesight. And he felt compassion. You can pray, feel compassion for me too. I really need your healing. My pain is horrible. My this or that or this illness or my dad or my child, whatever it is. And Jesus exclaimed to them, you're, according to your faith, According to your faith, not his faith. According to you blind men's faith, be it to you. So, some more ways we show unbelief. We've covered so far believing what God has somehow decided, he has somehow decided not to, not to heal. Um, but anyway, number four, we don't know what his will is. No, no, we know. He says his will is that, yes, I am willing that you be well. Most of the time, that is his will. Number four, excusing our doubts and fears and unbelief by believing that's no different than what the man who had a demon-possessed son said. I believe, help my unbelief. And we excuse our unbelief as being acceptable to God somehow because it's normal. Help my unbelief. Mark 9, 14 to 29. If you're unfamiliar with the story, read it in Mark 9. 
it's almost like this has become our acceptable template that we use today. That professing some unbelief, that's normal. And we feel better. Unbelief is what kept Jesus from healing people in Nazareth. We don't want it. I know the story is there and Jesus still healed that man's boy. I know that. He still cast out the demon. But it's better to rid ourselves of unbelief. Recognize it. Get rid of it. Jesus in Gethsemane understood pain that he would see us go through because he went through tremendous emotional pain, sweating blood. He'd seen crucifixions. He knew it was painful. Dreaded it. He says in Matthew 26, 38, I'm dreading this so much. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here with me. Most of us don't like to die or suffer alone. Stay here with me. Watch with me. So he does understand when we're afraid of a doctor's diagnosis of cancer, or the chances are you're not going to survive the surgery, or how things might end, and we're thinking about that. He understands pain we're going through. He certainly understands that. He certainly understands betrayal and being abandoned by family and friends, being scourged, being denied by his dearest followers and friends, being betrayed by them. And he understands us when we say, Father, I want to believe. Help my fear, though, not go into unbelief. I want to believe, totally believe. We don't want any unbelief. Don't accept that just because we have that example of, yes, I believe, help my unbelief, that we can all keep saying that. Here's another unbelief, number five. Upon the amen at the end of the prayer, always checking to see if the pain is still there, if the lump is still there, if there's any evidence that the healing has taken place. Is the numbness gone? Is the swelling gone down? Even if the pain or affliction is still there, we have to come to the point, if we want to get rid of unbelief, that that's not what we're looking at. What we're looking at are the promises instead. What we're looking at is to know that God does sometimes heal instantly and God sometimes takes a long time. Sometimes it's instant. Michelle, whom I touched, and she felt this energy and a bright light went up from her feet to her face and back down again, and she was healed. And her preemie was healed, but not instantly. Her preemie took 100 days to come out of ICU and out of the uh, preemie ward because it had to grow. It was only a pound, four ounces. God could have made that preemie instantly grow the extra inches and put on the extra weight, you know, another six or seven pounds instantly, but he didn't. But he did heal the preemie. When the doctor said there was zero chance of the preemie Nikki living past two more days, two days from birth. The man with the locked up back I talked about, who was healed instantly, we heard the three distinct clicks, just like that. But still, don't go looking for the physical. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, the doctor's report, the lump, the cut, the infection, the cancer growth, we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen. Oh, I saw that big thing the size of a 
of a washing machine fall off a truck that I was right behind. And I didn't have time to move right or left, and somehow we went right through all that and never hit a thing. I still don't know what happened. Cars beside me, ahead of me, behind me. Don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are just temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. My severe plantar fasciitis was so bad that it had ripped the top part near the toes and down by the bottom near the heel that it all ripped off. And one of the worst cases of plantar fasciitis my podiatrist said he'd ever seen. I was, I was in crutches. He, want, he said, you'll be crutches or walking with a, walking with a um, walker the rest of your life. You're not going to be healed of this thing. It's not going to get better. Well, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. He wasn't healed the first day or two or week or two. I kept praying, kept believing. And then the next morning, I'd still have to walk in crutches. Kept praying, kept believing. One morning, I woke up. All of the pain was gone. Here I am standing before you now. I can play pickleball. I can run. I can walk. Stop telling yourselves how bad it is. Start telling yourself how good God is over and over and over. So I'm giving examples of instant healing and examples of where it took some time, but you never lose heart. Stop telling yourself or others who are praying for you how bad your condition is all the time. That's focusing on the scene. That's giving power to the physical problem. I'm tired of us being in a congregation of the sick, in the church of unbelief. Do you pray but then expect the worst? That's got to stop. How about instead speaking out how great our God is? How about Proverbs 18, 21? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and we speak life to our body. When we pray, we must believe that the answer is already being given. Whether it's going to be instant or later, or a lot later, we don't know. But we have faith and trust that if it's later, then there are things I'm learning through the pain and suffering, like Paul said, to where he delighted in his sufferings that he was going through. That's in 2 Corinthians 12, I believe. You can go back and read that. I have a sermon on praising God, thanking God in and for all things. And that's part of this belief, by the way. Start praising God, even in the pain, even for the pain. Because in this pain, Father, I can look to you. I can look to Yeshua, my healer, and you're my healer, to touch me, to heal me. I can look to you for that. Whether you, take, whether you heal it now or take a long, long time. I praise you that I can come to you. We pray like that. And healing will happen. And here's another one. Another way we show unbelief is feeling we're just not worthy of being healed. So we lose faith. Because we had a sin, we let some lust in our mind, or, or anger, or lost our temper, or we broke the Sabbath, or, or something we know was wrong, or we had a big fight with the wife or the husband. And now we're praying for healing and uh, we don't have the confidence. We'll talk more about that next time. But even the centurion who came to Jesus said, I'm not worthy that you come to my house. Just give the command. And like I, as a centurion over a hundred other soldiers, I give one or two of them a command. I know it's done. I don't have to worry or wonder if it's going to get done. I know it's done. You do the same thing, Jesus. And go your way, Jesus said to him in uh, Matthew 8, verse 13, and as you have believed, so let it be done unto you. And before that, Jesus said, I've never seen such great faith, no, not in all Israel. And this guy's a Gentile. He's a Roman. He felt unworthy. Worthy is the lamb. Yeah, we're supposed to become worthy of our calling. 
We're supposed to live in a worthy way. Yes, I, I'll have to give a sermon on being worthy. Yeah, we're supposed to be worthy through Christ, in Christ. Worthy is the Lamb. So don't let that stop you. Finally, the one I'm going to talk about is having unresolved conflicts. You haven't gone to your brother to work out the problem in Matthew 18, verses 15 to 18. You, you, it says in Mark 11, when you're standing there praying, standing praying, you don't have to always kneel. When you're, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Mark 11, 25 to 26. If you have something against someone and you're praying and you think about that, Forgive him before you continue your prayer. That your Father in heaven also forgives you your trespasses. If you won't forgive, he won't forgive you either. And we know in Matthew 18 that if your brother has sinned against you, you go talk to him privately, whether you've sinned against him or he sinned against you. Work it out. Talk together, not with everybody else. I have a sermon about Matthew 18, 15 to 17. You go by yourself, one-on-one, -on -one, work it out. And over and over we're told also in Matthew 5 that if you're at the altar trying to give an offering and there remember something about someone else upset with you, you're upset with them, leave your gift at the altar, go work it out. Then come back and finish your prayer. Because 1 Peter 3 says even unresolved marital difficulties and issues will diminish your effectiveness in prayer. Husbands, honor your wife. Honor your wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life. 1 Peter 3, 7, that your prayers may not be hindered. I don't like hindered prayers. I hope you don't either. These are things that feed into unbelief. If you know you're not getting along with your spouse, or you'd like a divorce, good luck on any answered prayers. If you feel that you believe God really doesn't heal today like he used to, if you believe that, that's unbelief, the worst kind. If you believe that by his stripes we were healed means just spiritually, that's unbelief. Worst kind, terrible unbelief. If you're hanging on to the notion that it's okay to have some unbelief, like the guy who said, I believe, help my unbelief, that's not a template of how we're supposed to live. That was a story of God's mercy on him, even though he still had some unbelief. Don't let unbelief stick inside of you. If you're wondering if it's God's will, if he wants to heal you, read the stories. Yes, I'm willing, he said. I'm just giving example after example to help focus you that we need to be looking to God as our healer and get rid of unbelief. Don't be like the people of Nazareth who couldn't get any healings because of their lack of faith, because of their unbelief. From God himself who was on earth, Yeshua, Jesus, could not heal them or do mighty works except a few. And he was marveling at their unbelief. So let's start looking for more and more healings as we conquer unbelief and grow in faith, which will be part three. Don't miss it. We'll talk about what is the gift of healing. We'll discover the power and authority God has given us through Christ. There's still a lot to cover. There's amazing power God wants to show us. I've been gifted with having been able to see a few of a few of those times. I'd like to see many, many more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Abba, dear Daddy Father, our Father in heaven, our dear, dear Abba. Wow, we can call God Most High a dear Father. We come to you, we know you want your children to be well, just like we would want our own children to be well, even more so. 
You have all the power in heaven to do that. As it pleases you, you do as you please in heaven and on earth. We come before you. We ask you to strengthen our faith. We ask you to not get in front of or to block your will being done by unbelief. We ask you to help us believe, help us grow in faith, help us know you're willing and want to heal us. We thank you so much, and I hope that you will start showing a lot more healings among all who will be practicing these. We praise you. We lift our holy hands up to you. We thank you for all you've done already. We praise you and love you so much. And Yeshua, we love you, love you, love you. As our King and Savior, in your name we pray. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.